evening everyone uh, or good morning or good afternoon from depends on which part of the world you're joining from thank you for being here today uh, digra india welcomes to you it, uh, to a talk by dr tomash mayovsky mayovsky uh, okay i'm learning <laughs> thank you yeah uh, he's a game and culture scholar at yav yolonian university in prakao Uh, his research interests are dominated by triangulating digital games vis-a-vis -vis older cultural phenomena to reveal the way new medium conserve and transform pre-existing ideological structures. His current research project is to analyze relationships between digital game cultures and the ideology of the nation state. Uh, thank you doctor for making the time to actually come and uh, deliver your talk despite having a very tough time uh personally and the pandemic has really made our lives very different and very difficult thank you thank you very much and we look forward to your exciting talk um i just have a few housekeeping rules to point out uh please keep yourselves on mute uh, while the talk goes on and we shouldn't disrupt uh, disrupt the flow if you have any questions or comments please feel free to use the chat box we'll be taking them after the session thank you Okay, hello. Hello, it is great pleasure and great privilege to be here and be able to uh, share with you my few simple and humble thoughts. Uh, those thoughts are uh, basis of a research project myself and not only myself, but also my bright and uh, brilliant colleagues, Magda and Alex. Uh, are doing together at this stage and at this point i was supposed to be, have a, a lot more to present but then due to the pandemics we have some uh, the, the, the project is slightly delayed therefore coming here today uh, i have still more questions than i have answers uh, but at least i will share those questions on initial ideas with you and uh, well hopefully uh, something productive will come out of this um, today i will be talking about uh, nationality and the relationship between digital game culture national cultures nation states and um, stuff like that and of course it is a personal project to me because i am haunted like all poles by this old to be the digital game called the Witcher 3. Uh, the third part, as it is easy to uh, find out of, of the uh, series that then turn, was turned into media franchise only uh, uh, to, no, yesterday, the second season of the Netflix TV series based on books the game is also based on uh, premiered and two days ago in poland we actually celebrated 35th anniversary of the first uh, witcher short story being published and here you can see for example the postal stamp released by uh, in 2016 by a polish national post of commemorating the success of The Witcher 3 and Geralt of Rivia um, himself. That is, this is not a fake, that the stamp really do exist. And because of course it is a national institution, the post office, uh, then uh, it clearly, and in this case, they are using very clearly the promo shot from the cover of the game. Uh, uh, the overlap between the success the great success of this game uh, and uh, some kind of national ideology and some kind of national um, uh, culture, uh, also policy, uh, even in the one screenshot becomes quite apparent. But then of course it goes even deeper, as you might remember some time ago, uh, I was also dealing with the question of the Slavicness uh, and this um, pervasive concept that Geralt of Rivia is somehow a squatting Slav in a tracksuit uh, who's embodying some local cultural um, currency and displays uh, the capabilities of a Slavic nation, uh, whatever that might be, um, uh, to, into the wider world. And of course, it happens in a public discourse. Well, I am not here to, at least not at the time, to judge the Slavicness of the game itself. Um, and it also, uh, especially in my home country of Poland, uh, 
readily equated Slavicness with Polishness. You know, Geralt is very Slavic, but then there are no domes shaped like onions or uh, Tsars and Ivans and Baba Yagas. Well, there is uh, at least this one, this la the last one, but the last one also appear in Polish folklore. Then, uh, uh, okay, <laughs> I was distracted by the chat for a second, sorry. Uh, then, of course, uh, uh, the connection, the, the relationship between the Witcher and our Polish national uh, ideology goes even deeper. Uh, for example, it is uh, very heavily, um, at least it was very heavily embedded in Polish political language. Uh, when uh, Barack Obama, the, uh, the President of the United States from two presidents ago uh, visited Poland and met the Polish president from one president ago and from completely different uh, ruling party, which is now in, in opposition. He was given as an official presidential gift, uh, which are two, not three yet, but still in uh, already in existence. Uh, subsequently, uh, uh, ranked the worst gift given to U.S. president ever by uh, Washington Post. Uh, but then it was to um, express Polish speciality, being digital games, uh, and somehow uh, stressed out that uh, Polish national culture is somehow encapsulated in this game, which was not Slavic at all, uh, and very international actually in, uh, in a design. Uh, and it was not only with this uh, former political um, uh, par uh, party ruling Poland that digital uh, games were highlighted as important part of national culture. Uh, for example, uh, when Pol current Polish Prime Minister announced uh, the results of uh, um, some um, uh, negotiate financial negotiation with European Union uh, a while back, because actually those funds were subsequently frozen uh, due to Polish uh, political turmoil. But uh, back then, when he was uh, announcing on Twitter, and this is official uh, official Twitter of Polish Prime Minister, what you are sharing uh, seeing here. Uh, 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 he was referencing the uh, upcoming premiere to Cyberpunk 2077. This is what makes this screenshot very sad joke right now. Neither the premiere nor the, the funds delivered. Uh, but as you can see, uh, he framed, to, to make himself look more cool, he framed himself uh, with... Uh, uh, as a nice person by referencing to the popular meme, uh, the lettering, the, 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 the sign on the meme is rise up samurai, we have union budget to spend. Uh, and in the tweet itself, uh, he clearly states that digital games are a great success, financial and um, uh, 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 economical success of the Polish nation state. Therefore, as you can see, uh, even in the highest echelon of national politics, at least in Poland, uh, games are somehow important and present, even when they turn out to be failure. Uh, but of course, it goes far wilder and to a greater length than just some politicians using games to uh, warm the uh, public image. Uh, because the notion of Polish game is in Poland ever pervasive. We have various rankings and catalogs and history books um, and guidebooks and reports and whatnot and discussions over internet and in person over beer about Polish games. And of course, which are three always sits on top of those because it is the pinnacle achievement of 1000 years of Polish culture. Uh, but uh, on those lists, various games appears, and apparently some of them are on some measures considered Polish, others can be a bit debatable. Uh, but no matter the reasoning behind uh, entering the, or inserting the, the uh, uh, game on this list, uh, 
the important issue is that this notion even exists. Because on one hand, it seems to be a global medium, something that reach entire earth and uh, is produced by the uh, great global entertainment industry. Uh, even sometimes consider uh, the ultimate entertainment medium of the empire, empire in hard and negri sense, the empire, which is a, a global capitalistic system without the center and money based and money, as we know, do not have nationality. Please say this to your national money with Gandhi on it. Uh, mm, uh, then, uh, but on the other hand, constantly in Poland, we are discussing Polish games. Something, therefore, something interesting is happening and something is uh, brewing there. Because on one hand, we know what Polish games are. But on the other, I am not sure, or I started to think how it can even um, uh, withhold any scrutinizing this notion of Polish games. Therefore, we start, I started to think about how, Pol uh, how games and national culture can be tied together. But before we get, go there, there is of course some more explanation I owe you. And this explanation would be what I am talking about when I'm uh, talking about nationality or national cultures and stuff like that. But do not worry, Assassin's Creed got you covered. Uh, the concept, uh, uh, which is the ideological basis of this research is actually quite ancient and build upon uh, uh, the notion of difference and sometimes already uh, in Europe, already apparent in uh, ancient Greek culture. When you, for example, consider the oldest um, uh, European uh, uh, poem or epic poem or, or literary piece, which would be Iliad by Homer, it is basically of a story, um, the, the, the story about the war that broke between us, Ahai or Illinois, uh, us Greeks, uh, with them, people from other side of the sea, Trojans who worship different gods and wear di different clothes and speak different language. Even though those differences are um, missing from Homer, they were different people. Uh, because them took our woman and then we had to avenge. Uh, so all uh, moving parts or components of a proper nationalistic ideology is already there embedded in a home. And it is a, the, the concept that, which is pervasive in Greek uh, uh, political ideology. For example, Aristotle neatly distinguished, he was very good at neatly distinguishing uh, between those people who form the Greek community, the ecumene, uh, which were Eleanor, and those who uh, uh, follow Greek customs, but the, they are not Greeks themselves. Ironically enough, in Aristotle, those, those are uh, uh, considered Greekoi, and the Latin word Greece uh, or Grecia actually comes from those people who are not considered Greeks by Greeks themselves. And then you have your barbarians, those people who do not know proper language and they emit the sound which goes bar, 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 uh, like a, some farming machine um, from the mouth and therefore cannot be reasoned with. Uh, and also the first uh, basis of this distinction is formed, which is the language. Uh, it is important because it was uh, contrary to the Greek uh, political and um, economical uh, uh, living conditions. Uh, Greek ecumene was uh, uh, composed of various states with very various political systems, very, 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 very varied um, ideological systems and so on and so forth. And even though they were politically different, they still considered as themselves somehow connected. And well, there were various ideological um, uh, justifications for that. Uh, therefore, as one could assume uh, the uh, European culture was born already 
as a nationalistic one. But it changed a bit with uh, the rise of Roman Empire. Uh, in times of the Republic, the division was clear. People were born in Rome, the city of Rome were Romans, and the other people not born in Rome were not Roman people. But then in the empire times, uh, suddenly emperors gained those, uh, this ability uh, to grant Roman citizenship to people who were clearly from a different ethnic background. The first group actually admitted, the first foreign group admitted to the uh, Roman citizenships were actually some uh, noblemen from Britannia, from what is now England, uh, given the title by Emperor Claudius, who tried to uh, secure his conquest of Britain this way, making those people Romans, proper, properly Roman. And therefore the distinction appeared between the nationality, which is based on the fact that we are all sharing the same ancestor or something like that, and the citizenship, which is abiding the laws and being part, legal part of a country. And this became even more complex when the medieval Europe uh, superimposed religion on this concept. It was already present in um, Roman times, as um, ancient Romans uh, considered uh, the state-sanctioned uh, worship of uh, divine uh, uh, or divinified emperors uh, part of a uh, mandatory aspect of citizenship. This is why Christians were so, or Jews were so um, uh, difficult to uh, absorb in, in the Roman culture because they were monotheistic and therefore they couldn't worship or even pay lip service to Roman gods. Uh, but then the Middle, Middle Ages, I will not go into details because we are discussing about 1,500 years here of vastly different culture, uh, added the third notion, the notion of religion. Of course, in different parts of the world, um, the same, more, this, uh, same similar process happened. Uh, with the unification of um, uh, countries or kingdoms, realms, uh, and the widening and the rise of great monotheistic religions in the Middle East and so on and so forth. But I'm sticking with Europe for a reason. Uh, so uh, suddenly the more important distinction turned out to be not where you were born at, or uh, what uh, laws you are abiding, but which religion you are following, because Europe was Christian and therefore extremely prejudiced against Muslims or Jews and or other people with different religions. But also it was within this Europe of unifying faith when nation became suddenly a very operational um, idea and the more modern concept of the nation not as exclusory as Greek, um, was born in Italy uh, alongside the uh, concept of the university, because uh, first people who actually ascribe themselves nations in Europe were students uh, who commonly shared uh, the same quarters with people coming from their the, the, uh, own country, so they could use the same vernacular language and will be, not be forced to stick to Latin for and the, the entirety of the stay at, at Bologna or Padua University. This is where, for example, famously Polish uh, astronomer uh, Nicolaus Copernicus himself with his own hand signed to Nazio Germania uh, while studying there. Uh, but also it has um, other consequences for example, uh, for the forming of modern European states, uh, it was crucial to acknowledge the dist uh, cultural dist uh, the, uh, distinction uh, between uh, people living in various kingdoms. So gradually the concept of nation migrated out of the university, quite naturally because people were um, 
graduating from those universities that then, for example, became important um, members of bureaucracy in various European kingdoms. Uh, so the, those people started to tinker with a new idea that, for example, well, uh, people living in Italy are basically the sentence of ancient Romans who once conquered the world and created those marvels of architecture and law. And people living on the other sides of the Alps are well, maybe barbaric a bit. And therefore, uh, we all we all who share Roman blood should uh, consider create, recreating the Roman um, uh, state. The concept of Italy was born this way. And it was quite popular in Europe, but actually became a uh, the massive movement only when it was uh, uh, popularized by the French and American revolutions. Though two, those two important and again, very Western or very European uh, uh, historical events uh, turn the attention toward the nation as the um, um, justification for power. Of course, this idea itself was a bit older than the French Revolution, but for the first time, it became the basics, basics of actual political praxis, that for the power does not come from God or any other external or transcendental justification, but it is the expression of the will of the nation you know, democracy and stuff like that. Uh, and in French Revolution, it very quickly became apparent that it is a, a expression of the will of the nation because uh, revolutionary France was attacked by the, the neighbors, especially by Austria, um, who came to an aid the, uh, to the queen who was Austrian by birth. And therefore uh, it turned out it is not like all people are sharing our values and should be part of our new popular government. Only French people, because now we French people have to defend ourselves from Austrians who speak German uh, language and so on and so forth. Uh, this political movement was well married in time uh, with uh, the new political uh, philosophical concepts trying to uh, established new um, communities or new basis for, uh, for a human com community, well, the idea of God was not that appealing at this, as it once was. And on the other hand, uh, when um, uh, the uh, concept of popular rule started to be more and more popular. And therefore the modern concept, the really modern concept that, that you have those people who inhabit a certain space and while inhabiting a certain space face very similar um, uh, problems and tribulations. And while uh, communally um, overcoming those troubles, uh, forge similar culture, which is immediately understood by those who share this land space. And on this basis, the language is born and national traits are created. Uh, the, as this notion was first proposed by German um, philosopher like Herder or Fichte, uh, uh, it, they, for example, readily distinguished between Germanic people who are strong, strong-willed because they were uh, conquering the wild north of Europe and constantly battling with the freezing ground and early snow, destroying the crops, uh, always um, in danger of hunger. And it, this made them powerful people, not like those Italians from the other side of the Alps who are living in the called the, uh, in the warm and pleasant climate of the Mediterranean. And it is basically enough to put a stick in the ground so it will suddenly have uh, fruits. So they are lazy and does not uh, appreciate hard work and are quite soft and maybe a bit perverse. This antago cultural antagonism was well, subsequently made a very strong basis for a political uh, power 
and exported globally as one of those uh, horrifying ideologies during the, uh, the height of European colonial period in 19th century. This is something I perhaps, uh, uh, you, you perhaps understand better than myself. But for example, within a British empire, there was hardly a mo movement to naturalize people who are not considered uh, members of this British uh, community which shared certain traits and so on and so forth. The ideology of a nation became a tool of subjugation of those who are considered less wealthy because not belonging to our nation. This is what happened worldwide, but also this is what formed, uh, for example, the um, uh, principal uh, apparatus of um, uh, European empires. So, for example, the, it was heavily embedded in school programs, in, uh, in literature, in art, basically in every aspect of cultural life, suddenly uh, concept of nation and national traits, national languages, uh, the expression of a nation uh, became very uh, important to distinguish, for example, civilized from uncivilized, those who are um, uh, born to rule the seas like Britons are, and those who are born to be ruled by Britons and so on and so forth. This is how uh, France and uh, England and uh, Russia and other uh, European empires uh, justified their colonial effort uh, while man maintaining the difference between themselves and those who were colonized. And it brought a strange fruit after the First World War when the concept of nation became so widespread and so um, impossible to uh, discard that the new world order, which uh, appeared after the collapse of uh, empires, which started with the First World War and ended after the Second, uh, brought the uh, basic uh, political concept of the nation's uh, right to self-govern which formed uh, the new world of nation states. For example, uh, the League of Nations, now uh, United Nations, are not called United Countries or United Realms. Those are nations because if you have a country, the country should be of a nation, which is brought up the entire new uh, can of worms uh, because suddenly it became very important uh, to distinguish which ethnic group is actually a nation and which is just an ethnic group or a tribe or uh, uh, some sub part of the nation. Uh, it is difficult to uh, quickly summarize uh, the, uh, what are the defining traits of the nation. Uh, because the national culture turned out in the 19th century and in 20th century turned out to be all uh, encompassing and basically swallowed all other cultural uh, distinctions and cultural phenomena. So everything can be ascribed a national value. We have national landscapes. Uh, we have national foods. We have uh, national character traits, for example, almost every European country uh, nation ascribe hosp uh, hospitality as their national traits. Even Poles, famously gruff and uh, unwelcoming people, uh, consider themselves especially hospitable. Uh, then uh, all uh, man-made uh, arts and crafts and everything that can be manufactured can be attributed a nation. We have national art, national music, uh, national literature, uh, national screws, uh, and so on and so forth. Therefore, it is a label to distinguish between ours and theirs to various ends. And with digital games, it of course becomes complicated because uh, the concepts and the tools to distinguish between what's national and what's not were, was created in 19th century and therefore not always fit well with uh, how digital games are created and how they are. And to that I will uh, 
go in a minute because I suddenly realized that you came here to for a talk on digital games and you instead you got like 30 minutes of bubbling about the history of the concept of the nation. Uh, the, on, the last thing to remember is that uh, national culture is not to be uh, uh, mix up with uh, concepts like vernacular culture or uh, ethnic culture and so on and so forth. Uh, because not all expressions of folk or low or, or, or vernacular are considered national. Only those who are canonized are considered national because uh, as we are living in the world of nation states, uh, it is the state apparatus that decides what is national and what is, well, for example, just folk. Uh, what is, uh, for example, what cuisine is national and what cuisine is just regional, let's say. Therefore, uh, what I am aiming at is not to deal with the uh, those games who are used to um, present uh, uh, some ethnic or folk uh, ideas from, I don't know, Alaska or from uh, Scandinavia. There are a lot of those. Um, but what I am trying to look at are mainstream games, which are ascri very strongly ascribed national traits. And now when we know what I am aiming at with the concept of nationality, let's move forward to why it bugs me uh, when it comes to uh, uh, digital games, still following the example of The Witcher 3, because it is beautiful and um, uh, very telling example. Uh, the if when we uh, are talking about games being of certain nation, like Polish games, very often the uh, first criterion that springs to mind is a criterion well tested with other cultural industries. It is the country of production. This is, for example, how Polish Games Association is created. Uh, this is an organization uh, that unites various Poland-based uh, uh, digital game producing studios. Uh, and together they uh, are the, the board or the, the uh, best expression of, Pol of how Polish gaming culture has, uh, uh, is. Uh, and then uh, it is very tempting to assume that uh, if a game was produced by one of those uh, studios, which are uh, members of Polish Games Association, or at least registered in Poland, then there is it is a Polish game and there is no reason to go uh, any further. And in a way, of course, this simplistic uh, concept uh, might be um, uh, product, uh, productive. But then we need to remember that we are living in a world of global flows and currents. And for example, well, let's consider the project, the game, uh, the, the, oh, so the project Red, actually, uh, the firm behind the Witcher 3 success and Cyberpunk 2077 fiasco. There, it is a company registered in Poland. But when, for example, Polish government threats with taxes, then there is always an uproar that maybe the company should be moved away and, for example, registered in neighboring Czechia, where there are, it is easier uh, to have a company and the uh, fiscal uh, uh, burden is lower, and so on and so forth. If a company like ZDP, the very important Polish company, would move outside uh, of uh, the country, will would it be, cease to be a Polish uh, game company and therefore all games made um, by them from that moment forward will stop being uh, Polish? And what with the games which were already produced, would they lost the nationality with the next patch and update? Or they will be just slowly infected with Czechness somehow. And then of course, uh, it could be really deceiving to consider just the place the uh, company pays taxes in, because those are well chosen uh, to uh, optimize taxes. 
And sometimes it is quite common to register a company abroad and work somewhere else. Will it make it double national or something? But then you have to also consider that games are made by people. And that the, uh, in, especially in bigger studios, the act of making a game is something quite similar of act of crossing the ocean on a sales ship to buy uh, some foreign products and then move them back to Europe or to hunt whales or something. You have your crew, but this crew is mastered only for one um, uh, route. And then when the trip is over, they are disbanded and you are, when you are going over, and you are um, uh, leaving only a key person on the ship uh, before making the next voyage for which you are uh, hiring new sailors. Of course, it is not that drastic in game development company, as we all, uh, all know, and contracts can be a bit permanent, but there is a lo lot of movement within the industry, and people are constantly moving between the various studios, bringing them expertise, but also bringing the national cultures with them. And of course, uh, for example, those people on this photo uh, Gerald is looking at are very, very white. And then the maj majority of uh, people working on The Witcher 3 were ethnic Poles, or at least people with Polish nationality, because of course, some of them were of some minor ethnicity, or for example, were Silesians, and whether Silesians, the ethnic group of Poland, are separate nation or not, it is very debatable, uh, but they were at least shaped by the, uh, similar cultural conditions. But of course, there was also Americans, for example, in this team or people from other European countries working in this or that position. And those people of course, were, to a degree, uh, uh, speaking Polish in the company was forbidden at one point in uh, city project direct offices. Uh, so people coming from abroad and working on those games uh, are not felt uh, cast out because everybody's speaking Polish. Uh, and even it might consider a minor thing, if we know that games were created by people who are somehow born and raised, almost, uh, it is almost certain that they were raised in a school that taught them their uh, uh, national culture, because it is the prime uh, task of a school in a nation state. Therefore, even though if the company is um, registered somewhere, it does not mean that people working on a game are of the nation and that they are not international in the sense that they are created by various uh, national cultures. And therefore, the clean and neat division based on taxes start to get complicated. And then, for example, if we move past um, Witcher, we will encounter Cyberpunk uh, 2077, uh, which is a digital game made in Poland by mostly Polish crew. I actually sat through the uh, credits during the game to count uh, international sounding names, and there were not many. But it is also an adaptation of a tabletop role playing game series which was created by this gentleman, Mike Pondsmith, who is a very American-American, and not only American, he was also first prolific role playing, uh, um, black role playing designer. And somebody who was not only shaped by uh, cyberpunk culture from the movement times, but also by the black culture, which is a quite uh, important part of American uh, cultural, national cultural discourse and almost absent from Polish one because Polish mi black minority is negligible as uh, Poles were better at enslaving Ukrainians than at enslaving um, population of Africa. Not that we didn't try, but this is how it turned out. Uh, therefore, there is a strange question whether Cyberpunk 2077 is actually a Polish game because it was made by Poles in Poland, or is it an American game because it is based on American material and those people were trying their best to adapt them according to tastes of Mike Pondsmith, who was uh, at least claiming that he's supervising um, the uh, production. And then you have those games 
who are created under the banner of a company. Uh, and bravo, it is, it is precisely the question in the chat I, was, I, I am aiming at, uh, are created by uh, uh, international companies with various branches and then released as the game of the company. Uh, therefore, even though games created by um, uh, CD Projekt Red are usually considered Polish games, I have never encountered anybody who considered a game made by Ubisoft Sofia, Bulgarian one, just to stick with European examples. And of course, it is very similar with Ubisoft India. And well, it is a reason why Ubisoft um, uh, branches are scattered around the world because the sun never sets uh, over the Ubisoft empire. When one branch goes to sleep, the next one wakes up and in a crunch mode, they can just commit the works one to uh, another and then work nonstop without violating uh, workers' rights. Not that it matters that much in game development, but it is a, a different story. The point being, uh, with giants like Ubisoft or Square Enix or Electronic Arts, sometimes the brand, actually the, the, the major brand uh, of the producer, sometimes obscures uh, the uh, place where it was produced. And if we consider the place, uh, the, the producer as a, oh, sorry, as a major uh, contributor to the nationality of the game, then we have to consider which are one and which are two uh, American games because they were released by Atari, made by CDP, but internationally released by briefly uh, uh, resurrected Atari. And it counters our first observation that it was given to Obama as an expression of Polish culture. Because, well, and then you need to remember that games are not made from scratch. Therefore, some parts uh, are already created by some companies which are set uh, somewhere else. For example, the first Witcher you can see here was made with the um, same uh, game engine that was used in Neverwinter Nights, Aurora, the uh, game engine written by BioWare, the Canadian company. Is that making Witcher 1 Canadian at heart? And then the game became more and more Polish as they um, designed their own uh, game engine. Or for example, if game is using some uh, graphic assets or music samples created somewhere else to uh, combine them and compose their own, uh, the, the, the unique work of art. Or where, for example, they are hiring uh, uh, Russian and Ukrainian graphic designers who are advertising themselves on a, 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 a art station because they are cheaper than, let's say, American ones. Uh, and they produced something which is a basis for what we see in games. How this tension between a national culture that created people working on those uh, sketches and designs with the final product uh, happens. As you can see, even if we just consider the production as a basis for ascribing nationality to digital game, it very quickly starts to be a really complicated issue with no straight answer. Uh, in all the media, there was a very uh, clean division because for books and to a point even for a movies, it was the language that decided the nationality um, of a, a work of art. This is why, for example, uh, novels by Józef Konrad Korzeniowski, known internationally as Joseph Konrad, are considered masterpieces of English literature, not Polish literature, even though jo Joseph Konrad was ethnically Pole and he escaped this gloomy country uh, only when he was a teenager and in late teens mm, to jo join the Navy. But with games, you've got not only simultaneous release, uh, in multiple languages available within the same game the same time. So it is impossible to actually guess 
which is the my, uh, main language. Sometimes it is possible to distinguish between major and minor because, for example, minors are, are only subtitled and major are also voiced over. Uh, but then it is sometimes difficult to even guess whether the game was created in certain language. Maybe the studio was just communicating inside in English, even though uh, English speaking people were minority in the studio, but for uh, sake of clarity and to have a postmodern, need postmodern and so on and so forth, uh, the language could be quite, uh, of the production can be quite different from the language people creating a game are actually using um, uh, for uh, um, in their everyday co communication. So I believe it is a deceiving criterion and ascribing games nationality based on a, a, a production aspects can be quite tricky, especially as games are available worldwide um, uh, through uh, selling platforms. They do not have premieres in certain in uh, concrete countries. Uh, as you can see, it is very complicated. Uh, and if you consider GOG, it is a company which is owned by um, or part of CD Projekt, the Polish company, but it is registered on Cyprus due to uh, uh, fiscal optimization, or at least it was uh, when I last checked, maybe something changed um, back then. Uh, so suddenly even the nationality of CD Projekt uh, could be questioned when you look at it. Therefore, maybe other criterion the criteria would be uh, a better fit. Uh, because, of course, when we come back to The Witcher 3, it is still a Polish game. And despite all my misgivings and hesitations regarding the production, I can clearly consider it as one. And not only myself, this TV guy uh, also is talking about the Witcher phenomenon, which you can see uh, uh, on the um, uh, subtitle below his beautiful head. And well, content wise, it is easy to justify it. This is an adaptation of a Polish book. And therefore, somehow the Polishness of the book is transported into uh, the uh, novel. But then uh, it is a deceiving criterion because let's uh, assume games based on Lord of the Rings, a very English book, and the majority of those games are published and um, made by uh, American companies. Of course, we can consider Anglosphere uh, one um, cultural uh, sphere, but then English is a different nation from, well, I would say American, but I would prefer to say US Indian. Uh, and also, uh, there is the question, well, and the, the half of the content in The Witcher comes from the book. This I can get, but there is the other half, which comes from games. And there is also additional question to be answered, how national games cultures are shaping uh, those games which are created within a certain nation state or whether it actually is. Because again, uh, on the glance, it is quite easy. Uh, we have our video games, a digital medium. We have a clear, uh, clear and neat history of digital games. It started with um, the, the Tetris, then there were Space Invaders, uh, Super Mario Bros, uh, Doom, Quake, uh, uh, Tomb Raider, Knights of the Old Republic, uh, GTA, which are three uh, nice and unbroken line of games that created uh, what we consider global gaming culture. Also, it is not, because, for example, if you consider a local one, suddenly other games became important and you have those games which shaped people working on a game completely unknown outside of a certain nation. For example, I really doubt you have ever encountered this one the game, as you can see, awarded uh, the game of the year by the uh, world of computer games uh, monthly uh, back then, one of very many Polish point and click uh, adventure games, which were never made abroad, which were very uh, invested in Polish culture. 
and uh, quite important for shaping uh, the uh, Polish game, de game dev because those who subsequently became important figures uh, on our market started that work in uh, firms like Elki Avalon. Not a very Polish name, but it was the custom at the time. If you think whether the game is any good, I would advise against playing it uh, nowadays. Uh, but this criterion is again a very deceiving one because if we consider my prime example, which was Witcher 3, Polish point and click adventures were important, but only to a certain degree, as the Witcher is built upon the clear um, uh, inspiration with two titles. First one is Baldur's Gate, a very complicated example because this is a game uh, created that Canadian company based on a, a US Indian uh, uh, tabletop role playing system which became a cult hit in Poland because it was the first uh, major game that was given a full Polish voiceovers uh, and by uh, prime Polish actors, nevertheless. And it was a huge sell and uh, it was a formative, the, the um, uh, premiere of Baldur's Gate was a formative experience for basically all people uh, who have played uh, games, uh, digital games at the time in Poland. And it is a reason why uh, the same, well, not the same, but the, the engine um, from those uh, role-playing games were used in the first Witcher because they were clearly, clearly inspired by Baldur's Gate, uh, uh, Neverwinter Nights and games like that. But there is also Gothic, the most influential game that shaped Polish um, uh, players' uh, collective taste in digital games. And it is again very apparent that, that Witcher with its uh, tendency to make uncertain choices and to highlight racial divisions are not only building on what was um, in Sapkowski's books, but also in this German game, which was not very popular and influential on, um, on German as well, ascri popularly ascribed German nationality not essentially German, uh, not very popular outside of Poland and to a bit uh, Germany, to a point Gothic is usually left out from those huge compilations of the influential games that shaped um, the um, contemporary video games culture. Therefore, to assess uh, the position of a game against the game history, global and local, it is not just as simple to decide whether um, what was the national canon of games, what was created before, and uh, again, distinguish as we often do with literature between the world literature, the world being uh, produced by in English and French language, uh, and then uh, ethnic uh, literature or minor literature or national lit literatures uh, to be um, studied separately. Uh, because in games, the movement between those two is more vivid and sometimes quite uh, surprising when you consider it. Uh, but of course, again, when I am installing and playing my Witcher 3 game, uh, it is very apparent to me that it plays in, with various very common Polish tropes. For example, I've got, got this guy who is Ogier from Everett, and he has a sable like a Polish nobleman, and he is dressed a bit like a Polish no nobleman, not completely, but um, uh, the uh, similarity is here. And he has a haircut, maybe not like a Polish uh, uh, nobleman, more like a Cossack, but still uh, those uh, connections to what is considered a national culture, for example, taught in school as Polish national culture is really obvious. And it takes only a glance for somebody who was born in Poland to recognize this kind of landscape. I told you landscape can be national. Uh, those flowers, those the trees, those um, dirt roads, those uh, 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 wooden planks. This is all very similar to uh, the landscape of uh, Northern Poland. We can find out places, even uh, ruined castles made out of bricks are coming from there. And it is very easy to assume that due to this aesthetic connection, the game is 
really embedded in Polish culture, of course, only until you consider that about one third of the game is happening in a very different place, which is very clearly Norway. Uh, with Viking longships and very Norwegian uh, mountainous uh, snow covered landscape and names from a different uh, language and so on and so forth. And then you got your delightful expansion and your, in your delightful expansion, Geralt goes to uh, vacation to Mediterranean, uh, visiting something that is a crossbred of Provence and Tuscany province in southern France and Tuscany in central Italy. Uh, and uh, yeah, I could then uh, ironically say that it is because Norway is Poles are coming to work, Poles are migrating to work and uh, Mediterranean, especially Tuscany is where Poles are going to their vacation. So it still somehow, uh, somehow relate to a Polish experience. But then, it is important to uh, uh, remember that content-based um, uh, distinction between nationalities is really deceiving because, well, this is Polish, we have no doubts. But then the same year, there was a second great success for Polish game development company, 11-bit studio, which released this war of mine. Again, a game commonly referenced as Polish one, and, uh, but it is based on uh, diaries of people who survived the siege of Sarajevo during the uh, Balkan war. Well, the Balkan, the, 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 the um, one of many wars in Balkans, the one in the 90s, uh, when the Yugoslavia uh, uh, split apart. It even used uh, very distinctly uh, Balkan names. But I have never ever encountered anybody who would consider this war of mine a Bosnian game. It is a game made by Polish company and therefore Polish. And Witcher 3 is made by Polish company and it has a lot of Polish cultural um, elements and therefore it is a Polish game. And then you have stuff like, for example, um, Assassin's Creed 2 set in uh, uh, Florence and Venice, very uh, uh, strongly capitalizing on Italian culture, which is never uh, an Italian game, even though all the content is there. And it could be very well considered Italian game is if we um, consider the, the publishers deceiving. And then you have your marketing plots. For example, in Poland, there was a few years ago, a game released called Polish Empire, from Teutonic Knights to the Deluge. Uh, the uh, subtitle uh, um, aside, it is of course uh, a strategy game fa um, fashioned again after Total Wars, uh, which allows you to play a Polish um, nation and fight against uh, the neighbors. And as you can see, uh, uh, even the cover was uh, created especially to cater to Polish sensibilities. You have the knight uh, uh, under the banner with the white eagle, which is a Polish crest, fighting the knight um, uh, uh, in white uh, cloak with uh, black cross, which is a Teutonic knight member of a, um, a militant order of knights. Poles were battling for almost entirety um, of 15th century. And this uh, war is very important for Polish nation building sentiments because it was um, very heavily used in 19th century to create anti-German anti um, sentiment. But then it is only a Polish cover of a game which internationally was released as the Reign Conflict of Nations. And yes, there was a Teutonic Knight indeed, uh, but there was a distinct lack of the White Eagle. So the uh, knight attacking might not necessarily be, be a Polish one. And only in a Polish version of the game, it was Polonized. But it goes even further because it is a deceiving game. It is a Russian game, uh, which uh, originally was entitled Imperia Smutno Evremia. And Smutno Evremia, the times of trouble, uh, is a period of, uh, in history of Russia uh, where the uh, 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 to make a complex thing quite simple or to simplify uh, uh, the uh, 
modern Russia was created out of various dukedoms and uh, the, the power of Tsar was uh, uh, ultimately established after Moscow was conquered by Poles. And then there was popular uprising against Polish invaders. Polish invaders were repelled and the Russia, as we know it, was created as anti Polish movement or anti-Polish gesture. Therefore, as you can see, we are suddenly moving in a strange circle. The game was created uh, as a strategy games when your major enemies were Poles. But then, harshly, this part was uh, silenced. And for Polish market, it was turned around. And suddenly you were playing those good Poles fighting uh, evil Russians uh, to, the, uh, to the east. So the content, as you can see, can be equally deceiving, and it is very rarely used as a basic uh, of ascribing a game, a game a nation. Yeah, I'm, I know I'm going over time. I will be very quickly, quick, I promise. Uh, but then still, I'm playing Witcher 3, and I can feel right at home all those uh, uh, very distinct male faces with prominent noses and rose cheek and small eyes. Look at me. Uh, they are very Polish. Uh, those um, flowers under the roof, they are, they are coming from a uh, Polish uh, f uh, Christmas tradition. Those flowers painted of the walls. Yeah, there is a certain village in Poland which look like that and so on and so forth. Uh, but of course, the game is not only composed of uh, 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 its aesthetics. It is um, something made to be played. And therefore, the question arises, if we can ascribe national traits to a uh, game's uh, uh, aesthetics, is it possible to do the same with a gameplay? Or to be precise, are the mechanics or gameplays which are better or worse suited to transport what could be considered national culture? Because it is not at school. In the Witcher case, I am a bit not sure. It is a very international gameplay. And I consider it international because those games uh, very often uh, goes contrary to what is considered heroic or achievable in traditional Polish culture. For example, uh, in many games, you are playing a solitary um, uh, uh, avenger or, or warrior who is triumphing over the hordes of enemies. And the conclusion is that this person wins. And it goes very contrary to what is very uh, prominent in especially in 19th century, the nation building Polish tradition uh, in which the heroic measure is measured in martyrdom. And the proper hero, uh, we have no, we do not have time for me to ex exactly describe what has happened here, but you can probably guess that you have this solitary knight being unheroically killed with, uh, or cowardly killed with arrows like Boromir in Lord of the Rings. But it is not a, a redemption story like, like in Lord of the Rings. Uh, he's sacrificing himself and he's making made great because of that. It is very difficult to sacrifice yourself in a game, which is a medium about winning. Uh, for uh, all, consider another example. Uh, in multiple games, you have a progression and the notion that uh, the narrative progression is also um, uh, Mart with maturing of a hero who gets more and more capabilities and we, when he's strong enough, he strikes and he conquers, which is again very contrary to uh, Polish national uh, history and culture, which favors uh, brash youth over um, uh, seasoned uh, and wise uh, warriors. For example, in the story of Polish uprisings, uh, something that happened in 19th century when Poles were trying to regain their independence. Uh, the story repeats itself. You have your uh, true-hearted, 
inexperienced but uh, ready for action youngsters starting the uprising and some seasoned generals who are a bit hesitant to join the movement because they know how it will end. Therefore, uh, the notion of experience, maturity um, is not tied, uh, it's tied neither to uh, capabilities, nor to moral qualification to do something. It is opposite in this Polish narrative of regaining independence against, again, very contrary to what we meet in games and so on and so forth. You've got your games which are um, uh, team-based and the success depends on a, um, a collaboration between various team members who has various skills that uh, plays against each other. And Polish culture is a solitary one. It is a reason Geralt is a lone wolf uh, fighting. There is an excellent paper on that by Partek Schweiger. Uh, I don't know whether it is um, available in uh, English or not. I hope so. Uh, or, for example, you have international concept of uh, or English language com concept of uh, medieval uh, uh, and early modern culture being uh, mono-religious up until the reformation but even in the reformation the uh, war was then made on mono religious countries to, to decide which will be protestant which will be catholic uh, while in poland the uh, story is reversed in certain 16th and 17th century it is a tolerant country of multicultures and multi religions and it is still there is this national myth of Polish tolerance. I know it is very counterintuitive knowing um, how the international discourse about Polish goes, but in Polish national mythology, it is really important that Poland is considered a very tolerant country, tolerant towards different religions, of course, because there are limits on the, of the to tolerance and they are set um, on psychosexual identity. But with religion, it is, a, it is a fair game and it is something it is impossible to achieve in Crusader Kings and so on and so forth. Therefore, uh, there are, it is, it is possible to um, recognize tensions between the national culture and gameplay conventions and try to build around it. For example, the uh, Warsaw Uprising, uh, one of the pitiful events of, uh, in, 20, uh, uh, in the history of Second World War um, in Poland for a very long time was something like that because uh, games are about winning and the uprising tragic and important was also a major loss uh, then the game warsaw uh, came out uh, trying to uh, make sense of this strange conundrum you can play it and you can uh, see but there is yet one more question to consider if there is possibility of national aesthetics of game if there is a possibility to, of national um, gameplay or national um, uh, mechanics, if there is discrepancy, discrepancy it is perhaps also the uh, possibility of cocoa dance. It should be also considered whether there are national play styles. So it is possible for me to play like a pole or do I play like a pole not knowing that I am doing that because I am a product of my national culture. Are there really any differences? Well, this is the uh, most difficult to uh, answer question because most games produce the way they should be played and people fall into that. But where well, there is a possibility to distinguish between various gameplay styles, maybe something there is something going on to decide whether it is possible to play, for example, like a Pole or like a Italian or like a Briton or whatnot. Uh, I uh, made a very simple and dirty uh, uh, experiment comparing, well, comparing uh, uh, the uh, modding practices for the most open, and most heavily modded game that ever was, that would be the Elder Scrolls V Skyrim. The uh, screenshots I will show you are quite dated, um, uh, but I have checked today and it checks out. Uh, I didn't make new, uh, new screenshots because the uh, website design changed and uh, it is more difficult to squeeze uh, more mods into the uh, one neat screenshot. So I decided to stick with the um, uh, former uh, one, as I said, 
it is very similar now with very similar titles. Uh, what I have done was to find out the most popular modes with language filtered on. So I have checked which are the most popular modes for uh, uh, to be translated into Polish. So used by people for whom Polish is the language they are using during the game. So they are not installing English modes. And if you filter out those modes that will feature uh, on all occasions, like for example, the um, uh, new HUD or uh, false car and worms, which are the, those heavy um, uh, expansions fan made, it is very easy to spot that Poles are very interested in weapon and armor. You have immersive weapons, immersive armors, the dance of death, which is a mode that adds um, new death animations uh, to a game. Uh, yeah, I know I should be... <laughs> give me a, just one moment. Uh, and then I switch to French. And with French, something strange happened. Not a single weapon in sight, but a lot of mods that uh, relate to uh, followers and uh, uh, enables more followers and allows uh, more interaction with followers, not a single one on a Polish page. And then I have switched to Italian. And first I have discovered that they really like the flag. And then I have discovered that even though they are more similar to French than to Polish, they have a lot of modes translated, which deals with survival and immersion. And of course, it measures nothing. It is just a silly uh, exercise. But maybe there is something to that. And the fact that people playing in their national languages are translating different modes from English uh, basis, uh, who knows, maybe, um, Maybe it is uh, uh, some indication that something that could be considered a play style, national play style, actually exists. I don't know yet, but it is something we are trying to find out. And of course, you have those games and those uh, gameplay styles, which are already considered national. For example, visual novel, especially pornographic visual novel, is readily um, given nationality. Those are Japanese games, even though like half of them are actually made in Poland. Uh, but those companies do not advertise themselves as Polish companies. And when we are speaking about Polish games, we very rarely consider pornographic visual novels made in our um, uh, beautiful uh, and uh, noble country. Uh, so, uh, last one thing to consider, what can be learned from all that uh, and why I'm complicating stuff like that. Uh, the first obvious thing is that, well, uh, games uh, nationality exists and there are various, sometimes quite different or, or contrary uh, aspects that are used in a discourse. Of course, I mean that game nationality exists. I do not mean it essentially, like all games should be given passports, uh, but uh, as a discursive practice. And this discursive practice actually can be uh, tied to the place a game um, has in a global circulation of the medium. Because, uh, for example, uh, mm, uh, being given national identity, because there are games without nationality and those are American, of course, uh, sometimes uh, uh, produce uh, uh, or serves as an argument for or against. Like uh, you might uh, remember when uh, Mass Effect Andromeda was uh, universally trashed, this meme was circulating in few variants, comparing uh, the game with the great budget and made by a proper Western company by some Slavic underdogs. Of course, they were no Slavic underdogs. They also have a big budget and uh, produce it for, uh, for a long time. And I actually, I wouldn't make a bet on, for example, which crew was bigger, the Witcher 3 one or the one 
from BioWare behind Mass Effect um, Andromeda. And BioWare is a Canadian company. Can Canada is a country in a very in a various ways very comparable to Poland. For example, the population of Canada and Poland is almost the same. But in a disc uh, in an uh, international discourse of gaming, uh, Poland is some small country on the far side of the world and Canada is in the center. Therefore, uh, when those people are producing something from their hearts, those Slavic people, and of course in vodka, with vodka, um, uh, uh, and they showcase their culture, the magic happens. But then the magic stops to happen when uh, they are trying to mess with what is ours. Because of course, Cyberpunk 2077 was a really botched premiere, and the game, especially in older consoles, were unplayable. But, the, but also, a lot of criticism were coming from a place that those people didn't understood what Cyberpunk is about, or they do not understand the currents of uh, contemporary gaming culture, and they are moving something that is not revolutionary en enough and does not relate directly to the political landscape of the United States. Because with national culture, and with those countries which are given the strong national identity um, within a, a global gaming culture, it is far game, but only if you stick to what is considered yours. But if you grab in your dirty paws something which is considered mainstream, which means ours, uh, then you are trespassing and you have to be punished for that. Uh, as, uh, Assassin's Creed Valhalla, was at least as buggy as what cyber, was Cyberpunk uh, the 2077 at the premiere. And now I believe it is more buggy than the Cyberpunk. But the uh, uh, critical reaction was not nearly the same and Assassin's Creed Valhalla became, quickly became the best selling part of this very tired series. While what happened with Cyberpunk 2077, we all know. Uh, then, Nationality is very often used to justify the abuse. For example, it is very common in game, especially in Finnish game culture, criticism, because in professional one, it is quite different, to justify really questionable content. Like, for example, this game, which is about uh, date rape, actually, as a expression of national culture that should not be subdued to international sensibilities, especially that Japanese have the, this lab, uh, license to uh, produce perverse content because, well, this is the, the national culture. Of course, it is not. Whoever of you been to Japan, you know that those are prudish people uh, who are not all into hentai culture. Uh, but this, this, uh, this distinct, this discursive uh, frame justifies the very questionable content because it ties it to uh, national sensibilities. Then, of course, uh, you have those games which actually builds upon some national uh, uh, imaginary for domestic uh, purpose or to showcase is, uh, it, uh, it abroad as a, um, a marketing strategy. This is game uh, called Stalin versus Martians, which is about uh, Russian tanks fighting the invasion from Mars, Mars and Siberia during Second World War, a shitty game which was never a success. But also it was a clear attempt to, on one hand, build upon the legend of the great uh, 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 the, the great homeland war, or how it is called in English, I know how it is called in Russian, and on the other hand, to create some wacky, strange, uh, very ethnic uh, concept uh, to masquerade or to, to brush over the fact that it was not a very good game. But because uh, it was so easy to make, for example, maybe it is important to ask what is Swedish about Stellaris? Why? those Swedes are making grand strategy games, uh, are given license to constantly lecture everybody about how history works, even though it is, they know how history works from their own history handbooks, which are built within 
uh, uh, their own national culture. And therefore, the, the other thing is to uh, mm -mm, realize that those transparent titles, those that are considered just international, as are national, uh, as national as those who highlight the fact that they are ethnic. Then you have those games that actually build upon something very local, like Red Comrades Save the Galaxy, uh, the cult Russian game, which are built on a series of very popular la Russian language anecdotes about um, uh, Chapayev, Vasily Ivanovich Chapayev, uh, the cult figure and the commander during Russian civil war you have probably never heard about. And it is impossible to understand the game without understanding not only the context of those anecdotes, but also the position of Chapayev anecdotes in Russian culture in, uh, in the 90s. Uh, actually, uh, we have a chapter on this uh, in video games and comedy, a book to be published uh, by Palgrave next January. This is the uh, advertisement part. The book uh, I had a pl pleasure to um, uh, edit alongside Krista Bonello, Ruter Giappone, and Jaroslav Schwelch. Uh, and finally, the last minor thing, and I, well, actually, my major, but uh, only to be sketched. When I, we are discussing Witcher, constantly the concept of Slavicness was appearing. I was distancing myself with that, calling it a Polish game. But internationally, it quickly became um, known as a Slavic game. And moreover, Slavic aesthetics and Slavic games started to be popular. This is, of course, not Witcher, uh, 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 not, not, not uh, Witcher 3, but even a Slavic story. But you have also, uh, well, a, a lot of those games. Some of them coming from Poland with a distinct pagan aesthetics, and some of them coming from Russia or Bulgaria, uh, even though Bulgarians are technically not slaves. Uh, <laughs> Slavs, I'm sorry, not slaves, Slavs, Slavs. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, but then if you dig deeper, of course, you have to start to consider what, what is the position of slave, the Slavic uh, paganism within the scheme of Polish national culture. And are those references completely benign? Because they are not referencing a folk culture people are living by. This is long gone. Slavic culture is a construct. And it is a construct created in 19th century and then catered very carefully in 20th century uh, within Polish um, nationalism very heavy uh, nationalistic culture. A lot of neo-pagans are also neo-Nazis. And even though I know that those companies are not, and they are just using this pagan Slavic aesthetics as a marketing ploy to sell the game, involuntarily they are validating neo-Nazi neo-paganism, which is quite a problem in Poland right now. So there is one last thing to consider. National culture, as shown already in Homer, is a violent one. And it is based on a distinction between us and them. And well, it always ends up badly. And therefore games are, to a point, a very good medium for that because games are also built upon conflicts. And because of the global popularity, they can be readily used to justify various nationalisms as well, well justified attempt to just showcase our culture. And that would be it from me. I am sorry for going so long, but as you can see, I have a lot of thoughts about it. Thank you so much for your extreme patience. I will try to address what was in the chat now. Thank you, Professor. It was a fantastic talk and it got, got a lot of us thinking about different aspects of game cultures and how it is circulated and perhaps the nationality of games. Uh, so, sir, as you can see, there are a variety of questions in the chat box. Uh, yes, uh, yes, yes. yes uh, Would you like to take it together or should I like read out one you answer and then... Uh, maybe that will, that will be better. Okay, okay. Thank you, sir. Uh, if, uh, so I think the first question you briefly addressed it uh, mm -hmm. during your talk, 
if prince of persia remake is being developed by ubisoft india would it be considered indian what would be the nationality in such cases so you briefly addressed this if you had yes yes comment. but to, to go even deeper it is a very fascinating case because prince of persia is of course persian and persians persians we know that nowadays they are called iranians mostly and that uh, iran uh, is building the national propaganda on the legacy of persian empire at least to a bit and then you have a game developed um, in europe they were remade by this french based company who became the um, global um, uh, phenomenon and then you have a remake made by uh, 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 the indian branch of uh, french but multinational a company so it makes a fantastic and very complex case and i would be very um, uh, uh, very cautious about ascribing it nationality but we can see how it can be used you know for example if it is a hit it can be uh, made a, a point of pride for example for outlets of nationalism in in their culture if it is a failure it can be blamed on indian culture by international and by international i mean english speaking a gamer community you know like those indians do not know how to make a game so uh, it does not have nationality per se but it can be used very easily to cater to various nationalistic discourses and that would be my answer for the first one thank you uh, so I'll go to the next one. This is from Mochin to Debna. What is the nature of the effect of digital games on nationality? Is it universal or is it dependent on a nation or on a on a nation to a nation basis? More precisely, how would you place digital games in the cultural paradigm? Is it art? If it is art in the cultural paradigm, then what is the difference between this art and traditional art, which has played a key role in forming cultural cultural national identity? It's a big uh, question. It is a big yeah. question of a, and a very complex one. And I will start in the middle. Uh, I believe that what whether games are considered artistic medium, of course, not all games of art. It, that would be an uh, insane thing to say. It is like to be said that all paintings are art, even those painted by seven-year-olds and displayed on a refrigerator. But uh, it is very uh, uh, easy to observe that it, in those countries which have uh, successful uh, uh, game development companies, uh, which made success uh, in global circulation despite being uh, semi-peripheral or peripheral, it is a uh, more willingness to consider video games art. Like, you know, uh, uh, for example, in Poland, there was a brief debate whether digital games could, uh, should be made part of uh, school curricula, for example and uh, consider uh, um, something to be taught at schools on equal rights with literature. It is because they, those games were successful. Uh, so uh, it is it, here you have your first uh, difference. And uh, again, interesting conundrum or paradox is revealed here because uh, with those um, uh, cases, the ultimate judge of success is, of course, not the national population, but the Anglosphere. And whether it was a hit in the United States, whether it was a hit in Western Europe, those people decide which game is good and which game is not. Uh, and nobody cares whether the game was a major hit in, I don't know, uh, Indonesia a great country, a lot of people, uh, uh, big market, but still somehow metacritically that does not aggregate that many reviews from there. You probably have seen that. Uh, so uh, because of that, the position of the medium as art in semi-peripheral and peripheral countries are very dependent on the whim of, a, of metropolis which is much more hesitant to consider game art 
than uh, those semi-peripheral and peripheral countries. Uh, to uh, what is the exact influence of games upon the national culture? This is something to be actually um, scrutinized. I do not have a definite answer. It is. Uh, very obvious that again for semi-peripheral and peripheral not metropolitan um, uh, countries it is uh, often a point of pride that the games are well re regarded it was the case of poland but also for example of finland when uh, uh, angry birds became a massive hit uh, because it it also proves that we, even though we are Slavic people who are supposed to uh, tend to land and grow crops, uh, we mastered uh, new technologies and we command over technological tools. Um, and it has very uh, uh, easily observed influence. In Poland, for example, we have an influx of digital game producers. Uh, a lot of universities started to offer game design uh, programs and so on and so forth. So it became a vocation and a valid professional choice. This is certain. What is What else to be there? It is there. I don't know. I want to check out. Will that be it for your answer? Thank you. Um, so, okay. So as I think we're in the question answer session, if anybody would like to unmute and ask their questions, you, you feel free to do that. Or I can continue reading up, whatever is preferable. Salip, would you like to ask a question yourself if you're still in the meeting? Mm, I don't see Philip with us, but it is more of a comment than a question. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll read it out. Okay. And actually, Speaking... this is... please. No, please go ahead. I mean, I no, 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 please. No, 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 uh, please go ahead. Yeah. Speaking of Poland, recently the Minister of Culture recognized Polish Democene as intangible cultural heritage, which was welcomed by many gamers in Poland. Considering your lecture, I wonder if this gesture of the Polish uh, conservative government is more justified in the case of underground demo scene than in the case of video games. The latter ones, as you rightly pointed out, often created people of different nationalities. So, well, it is more yeah. of a comment than a question. I would say yes. perhaps. I would say perhaps. <laughs> Okay. But uh, because I do not want to go to the rabbit hole of what could be considered art and heritage and uh, because, well, then we started to think about well, how we can, for example, consider movies and art because they are also made by multinational teams. And for example, you have those Polish uh, photographers in Hollywood and they are constantly making movies which are considered American. And then uh, we'll go to the rabbit hole or whether uh, great masters of Renaissance painted the frescoes themselves or with the pupil, pupil, pupils and so on and so forth. It very quickly becomes a very hard mess. Maybe let's avoid the problem of art. Right, right. Okay. Uh, Shohum, would you like to ask your question? I think I'll just Oh, wait, is there a response? Okay, sure, thank you. Uh, so for a simple consumer who is playing the game, does their nationality have any role to play in the already multidimensional nationality of the game and vice versa? Does the act of playing the game subvert their own sense of nationality? Mm, I would yeah. I wouldn't say so. I wouldn't say that perhaps with people with strong national sentiments playing games considered of be, to be the of their own nationality, it reinforces um, uh, certain um, national sensibilities. As I was uh, trying to explain in the last part of my talk, uh, there is also the problem of validation. That's, for example, some fringe nationalistic sentiments uh, can be showcased uh, showcased internationally and get international recognition as, as something neutral. Uh, mm -hmm. It was also something uh, Warhorse was trying to achieve with the Kingdom Come Deliverance, but it strangely backfired due to mm, racist policies. Uh, uh, 
-hmm. And of course, for a particular player, the ascribed nationality of the game can be a very important factor. For example, we have all around the globe, we have those people who consider themselves um, uh, players of Japanese games and uh, are fond of the certain aesthetics, uh, certain uh, uh, narrative choices we encountered in visual novels, in uh, Japanese RPGs, and so on and so forth. So they thoroughly check whether, for example, a game is uh, really Japanese, or for example, like Genshin Impact is a Chinese game masquerading as Japanese. Uh, so uh, this is something that plays a huge role. We know I can easily, for example, imagine people who in Poland who refuse playing Russian games. Or, for example, I can easily imagine people in Greece who does not play um, Banner Lords because it is a Turkish game. And the hatred toward uh, Turkey is stronger than the um, desire to play this game. Uh, it is, uh, Shevig was constantly writing about the unpleasantness of encountering Indians uh, in uh, European, uh, Europe or American produced games. So there is also this problem that you can um, find your nation misrepresented and your culture mistreated due to, for example, stereotypical or simplified uh, portray. And those are all things that uh, sh should be considered because our culture is what we are told. Our culture is in school, in home, uh, in public ceremonies. And this, those are all tools of nation state that were installed there to, for example, make you Indian, not Bengali or whatnot. <laughs> Thank you. Uh... So I think the next question is by Samuel. Samuel, would you like to unmute yourself and respond or should I read it out? I, I can ask a question myself, thank you. Hi, Samuel. <laughs> hey, Thomas, long time no see. How have you been? So-so. <laughs> uh, as for my question, uh, you showed uh, in your presentation that games can be a product of multiple identities and vision from all around the world. However, I wanted to know what is your stance on the influence of big studios and publishers in which the higher up are sometimes mostly or exclusively composed of one ethnic majority that has most of the executive power on the content of games, even in a context where part of a game can be made in many different locations at the same time. Excuse me for the long question. <laughs> uh, and a very valid one, of course. Um, uh, the na nationality of producers is also something important to consider. But as you uh, expertly pointed out, uh, national culture is a tool to uh, erase ethnic differences within the nation state. So, uh, well, in Canadian example, uh, it is quite complicated because uh, as far as I know, only for example, recently, um, there is, uh, there are some uh, movements towards recognizing uh, how Canadian nation state was treating the non-English citizens, for example, people from the First Nations uh, or French Canadians. Um, and, uh, with, no, uh, with countries which are no former, not former colonies, it is even more difficult because, for example, in Poland, um, uh, uh, it, local and ethnic identities are very often, if not erased, they are at least not treated seriously because the uh, discourse of unifying uh, nation uh, is so strong. Uh, therefore, it is to be considered not only um, whether the nationality is a factor here, but also has the, how, how the idea of nationality creates this um, uh, machinery that allows for uh, erasure of various differences. But yeah, the problem is, but then the producer does not control everything. 
It is not like uh, every single deci aesthetic decision made in a game is uh, thoroughly scrutinized by the producer who might not, not be interested, who might be, uh, uh, I don't know, distracted or just letting it go. So it creates even more of a mess. But then in uh, numerous uh, countries, there are attempts uh, to somehow support the production of national games, which uh, should be used to showcase national sensibilities, national culture, and so on and so forth. In Poland, we had an attempt, uh, but the uh, uh, bill never made it into the uh, governing body. It was discarded in late uh, 2019. I have just today, the, the, I have to check that. But for example, in Norway, they have this council that uh, uh, gives tax reliefs to uh, games that are um, Norwegian. And to be Norwegian, you have to fit certain criterions. So there is yet another level that falls uh, very brutally with uh, economical pressure, falls certain uh, ideology on how games should be. For example, in this Nordic case, uh, one of the traits a uh, Norwegian game should display is to be children friendly, because the um, governing governors of Norway try to showcase that Norway is a country uh, very um, taking care of the children. And it has to be reflected in a game to be considered properly in Norway. So it is very complex and very political. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Hirono, would you like to ask your question? Uh, yeah, sure. Thank you. I'll go ahead. Um, so I was just wondering, what do you think of the cases when misrepresentations of culture are embraced and appropriated by developers belonging to that very culture, which they themselves are also misrepresenting? Like in Ghost of Tsushima, these majorly Japanese developers incorporate a very pop culture informed view of the katana and the samurai that is far from historical authenticity. Uh, yeah, because the play, game is to sell to the English speaking population. And uh, uh, because of that, you are always um, torn between, for example, what could be considered historical accuracy and what could be considered uh, the, um, catering to the stereotypes. Uh, that is for sure. Uh, but then uh, it is also something Japanese culture do to themselves. You've got all those uh, not very historically ch accurate Chambaya movies. I am, of course, not Japanologist, and I rely on what people uh, uh, from, from Japan or uh, knowing their stuff were telling me. But uh, uh, playing with your culture, it is also, it, it is a tricky, tricky part. Uh, because, well, maybe those people who came from certain culture are more entitled to take certain liberties than people who came from the position of ignorance. But yet again, this is done to cater to people from, uh, uh, who, uh, who uh, approach the game from the position of the ignorance and therefore would not appreciate the fact that um, uh, warriors, uh, Japanese warriors in times of Mongol invasions were not, no Sengoku Jidai samurai. Uh, so you have to have this very recognizable armors from 17th century uh, appearing 300 um, years before that. So of course it reveals again, how national cultures interplay with the global power relationship and that the nation state is may, might be sovereign, but the cultural currents are still very much governed by the influence of the metropolis. Thank you. I think there's just one last question which I missed while scrolling. Uh, it's by Anubhav Anand again. I'll just read it out quickly. Is there any relationship between the player's nationality and the way one would play for a game like Rise of Nations? I would love to know. I think you, 
I would love to know that. And uh, tr we will try to find out during the research project. But at this point, I can only say that I have working hypothesis that because in schools and in national literature and in national holidays, we are uh, constantly reminded what heroism is then we uh, carry over this idea of how to be heroic to the way we are playing games. Thank you so much for your patience. You answered so many questions. No, no, it is I who, of... thank you for the patience. I know I got, I, I really overstrained this, my, my time constraints. But well, as you can see with this, I easily get carried over. No worries. I mean, we really had the opportunity to learn and think about along these lines. And uh, for people like me who said, who was very new, who were very new to this, it, it was very, it was a great learning opportunity. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Uh, so, yeah. So I think uh, Oritra has very kindly shared um, some links. Uh, which give us give more information about what we do at Digra India. We also have a YouTube channel um, where we upload recordings of the talk. So in case you miss it live, you can always go back to the recording. Um, thank you, sir, for your uh, time and your patience. And we really, really enjoyed this talk. Thank you so much. It was great pleasure to be here. I hope to see you all soon enough.